Hey, Patrick. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm going to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions. Sure. The first one I have is, why do you think the lobbying profession is misunderstood? Uh, I think that uh, most people are introduced to uh, lobbyists through film, television, uh, uh, rumors, things like that, uh, as opposed to the reality of uh, being in a, a state legislature or a local government and seeing how they actually operate to help folks uh, make decisions based on industries that they don't necessarily work in or have any expertise in. So. Uh, while there is definitely the kinds of lobbyists uh, you'll see on TV and film, uh, it's a very small percentage of them. Uh, the the rest are a sea of folks trying to explain incredibly boring, detailed concepts to uh, folks that are in power and totally uninterested, but have to because legislation affects just about every corner of business. And um, if you had to describe lobbying in one sentence, how would you describe it? Uh, trying to distill very complicated information to folks that have uh, no real expertise in it. That would be its most basic form. Uh, and then on a higher level, uh, to people that maybe do have some expertise in it, but don't necessarily have the time dedicated to see some of the pitfalls, problems, or unforeseen uh, uh, consequences of uh, leg legislation or lack of legislation. Hmm. So if you had the opportunity to be the governor, um, what would you do? Oh, it would make it like so much more illegal to not use your turn signals. I think that's that's like the first place. <laughs> I would go straight at the voters. I, I would... Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of opinions. I don't know that my personal uh, agenda is necessarily uh, uh, the most important uh, uh, because I've spent a lot of my uh, career helping other organizations uh, get uh, their message across or their legislation and their priorities uh, moving forward. Uh, uh, my priorities uh, as uh, as both a an, uh, a government affairs professional and a comedian might not be uh, well suited for uh, the person in charge of an entire state. Okay. If you had to change one rule in the state government process, what would you change? No, oh, that's a, that's a, a great question. Uh, I would think uh, during public comments, there should be a court jester nearby. I think that, uh, We've got to keep some of this uh, light. Uh, it gets really heavy. It gets really dark. It can be very problematic. Uh, I think a palate cleanser while we're talking about these things would help uh, uh, calmer heads prevail. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little wild, but uh, that, that'd be my recommendation. <laughs> Good concept. How, why do you think um, the youth has to be more involved in government relations? How would you encourage them to be? Well, because I think that the, one is going to affect them uh, uh, drastically. I think most uh, youthful people don't recognize the impact uh, government has on their lives or specifically local government has on their lives until much later. Uh, so if you can get ahead of that, especially when you have the time, resources, uh, and gumption as a young person to get involved. Uh, I, I think that that's a really important part of it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard for somebody like me, you know, starting to have kids and a family uh, to be able to stay super late at night for a, a, a city council meeting or some other uh, legislative uh, project. Uh, but in my 20s and early 30s, that was that was something I did have the time, resources and dopamine and serotonin to actually uh, to, uh, to have an effect on. And so uh, I would I, I would really uh, push for folks that have an actual interest in it to get more involved. Uh, I, but at the same time, I try not to push people. I try not to force people into 
this kind of thing. If look, if, if politics is not your thing, if 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 that's not uh, a, a real interest to you, I don't want you going in there with a with very thin understanding or opinions. You know, to just stick to whatever your hobby is. That's fine. But if you do have an inclination towards it, I would I would definitely encourage it. Um, I usually do this before the podcast begins and I forgot to ask you, but could you just introduce yourself and write a, tell us a quick bio about yourself? Um, sure. Uh, my name is Patrick Arnold. Uh, I am a CEO of Arnold Group, a uh, public policy and political consulting firm. Uh, previously, I served as the CEO of the Charleston Trident, uh, I'm sorry, Charleston Home Builders Association. Uh, before that, I was the government affairs director for the Charleston Trident Association of Realtors. Uh, for that, I ran the national consulting firm Push Digital, uh, doing races all across the country. Uh, for that, uh, I was a hard gun for campaigns and elections for many years, uh, and I got my start uh, working with uh, Governor Bobby Jindal and his campaign uh, in Louisiana, um, where I'm from. I am. Uh, you know, I'm born and raised in uh, Cajun country. Uh, I don't have an accent. Uh, this isn't a witness protection program cover story. Uh, my mother was an English teacher. So uh, I know there's some suspicion there. Uh, I like to say I'm highly, highly distilled swamp trash. Uh, I just I just speak well. Uh, but uh, I try and bring that kind of uh, fun energy of uh, Cajun culture uh, uh, everywhere I go. Um, I realize now that I'm shamelessly wearing uh, the outfit of uh, James Carville, so I'm kind of uh, a little mortified that I'm uh, ripping some, but another political consultant off. Um, but yeah, that's my that's my background. Um, kind of a, a my, my short bio. Nice. And um, can you tell us, like, when you got into this field of government relations, was there any specific skill you had to develop over time yeah my my entry into politics is a little different than most so i was in undergrad as a, a construction management uh industrial engineering uh student uh so my i, I was building houses post katrina in baton rouge from uh the migration of folks that came from new orleans uh i, I had a I had a crawfish restaurant I was doing at the same time I was in school. I was doing a whole lot of things that had nothing to do with uh, politics. Uh, and funny enough, I ran into uh, a friend of mine, an old, old friend of mine from Cajun country. Uh, I'm going to name drop him. Uh, Danny Russell. Uh, he's an attorney in Baton Rouge. And uh, I, he asked me what I was doing. And I told him I was building houses and everything else. And I was pretty miserable. Uh and uh, he said, well, why don't you come work on this campaign? It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I, I just blindly accepted it. And, uh, you know, like five months later, I'm working in the governor's office. So this is, it, and that was uh, Governor Bobby Jindal. And it really helped me coming from this engineering background and this project management background that when I started working on the campaigns, I quickly uh, saw a structurally how campaigns and operations were working a little differently than they did uh just because of the the way that you have to go about uh building things and 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 scheduling them out and i saw a lot of inefficiencies that uh really served me well in campaign work because i was just kind of coming from a, a different background and angle so uh i would say back then you did not see the standardization of a campaign process the way that you see it now. So uh, it served me very well in my early years that I could kind of just look at a campaign as a whole and, and be able to put all the components together. Uh, and in fact, I, I did that for some of my earliest races was put it all in project management software like it was a construction engineering project and crash the schedule to see how how much faster and cheaper I could do a campaign than what everybody was kind of anecdotally telling me how you how you ran a campaign, um, and 
that really helped me lock in a lot of clients because they didn't see me as, you know, a, a failed uh, uh, pre-law student uh, who didn't make it in the <laughs> law school uh, <laughs> looking for a career in politics. I was I was kind of this slight outsider with this engineering degree, um, even though it was one of the engineer, easiest engineering <laughs> degrees I could have gotten. Um, so uh, I tell a lot of folks uh, getting into politics that like, you don't have to necessarily have this specific background. In fact, a tilt shift perspective can often lead you to doing some really cool things in a, in a, in a campaign or, or public policy uh, organization that they may not think of because of uh, where they come from. Mm. I did notice that you have um, a, a hobby or passion for, towards stand-up comedy as well. So can you tell us a little bit as how did you, that begin? And then, you know, where can people find you? Oh gosh. Uh, yeah, I do. I do not publish anything online. I don't, uh, I, I, if, if you want to see it, you got to uh, wait for a showcase show or something in Charleston. I do do it a lot uh, less uh, frequently now that I've had kids, but uh, I got my start doing that uh, when, you know, in college, I played around with uh, uh, comedy a bit, uh, but it wasn't until the 2012 uh, campaign cycle I had run some we had like 30 something races uh, going through the firm and I, I mean I completely burned out in one year uh, after years of doing these campaigns this is the one that broke me and so uh, I I left the firm and uh, it was, it's a good buddy of mine left on good terms and uh, that next year I just did stand up I learned how to do stand up comedy for a year uh i'm gonna give a, a shout out to uh comedian dusty slay out of, who came out of charleston uh you, everybody go see his stuff uh he really helped me learn how to do uh stand-up comedy and i mean i just did that for an entire year and um it, and it served me really well going forward uh i was already doing a lot of public speaking anyway but this kind of married the public speaking with actually having something interesting to say uh or or keeping people's attention at eight o'clock in the morning on a at a political conference you know uh i i, I say uh my shtick can can sometimes be the depressed weatherman uh <laughs> i know i'm i'm telling you a dark joke but i'm telling you with this <laughs> now we're doing cincinnati um <laughs> And so, uh, anyway, uh, I'll I'll have some um, some dates up, uh, ho hopefully going into the fall. Uh, for folks to check it out. But I will. But most of my most of my act is not is not political at all. Uh, okay. I shoehorn that into when I'm doing my public speaking and uh, teaching people about government affairs or or political consulting uh, conferences and that sort of thing. <laughs> That's really cool and awesome. Um... What is the best advice you ever received? Oh, well, um, you know, it's a tough one. Uh, I gotta say, uh, it's, it sounds a little cliche, but, uh, stay true to who you are. Um, know that, uh, your, your personality uh who you are and what you believe in and your things uh, uh that, that make, uh, make you uh unique as a person uh can be healthily incorporated into your professional life into your work life like a, a, it's nothing wrong with me telling jokes and being funny at work as long as they're appropriate things to say uh, uh you, you don't have to force yourself to be just like what you see ahead of you uh don't 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 think that like uh if, if you want to be a lobbyist i have to i have to buy the same suit as that lobbyist i gotta i gotta i gotta walk talk and act and chew gum like him uh or her it, it, you don't have to do that you 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 can be who you are so long as you're being professional you're you're providing a quality uh, a quality job uh and you're always looking to learn and not afraid uh to admit that you you don't know something because you have the intention to learn and uh figure out how to do something i think that all too often people 
uh, feel like they have to fake it till they make it in the wrong way. Uh, I say fake it by getting into the room. All right. But you don't <laughs> have to, you don't have to emulate uh, somebody else. You, uh, you gotta, you gotta grow yourself or else you're going to wake up in your thirties and forties and be like, who am I? Mm-hmm. And that's uh, nobody needs that existential crisis. Once your career finally gets, uh, gets going. Good point. Good, good advice. Um, how would you describe yourself in one word? Um, hmm. It would be shameless for me to say funny. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and I, say, yeah. <laughs> I, I would, I would say, uh, genuine to a fault. Nice. But that's Ooh. not one word. But so I like breaking. Uh, rule breaker. It's also not a word. <laughs> nice. Um, who was the most famous person you met? The most famous person I met. Oh, man, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, I want to say I want to say Ric Flair. Uh, from I, the I, from I the wrestling, that's, from yeah, the wrestling, wrestler, wrestler, oh, nice. Rick Flair met met him in an airport. Uh, oh, nice. uh, had a drink with him. That was that was cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's tough because I'm uh I'm I'm not really a big starstruck guy. Uh, I I don't uh, I've 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 met tons and tons of people because I've I've lived on the road. That's a that's a really funny thing. You actually do meet a lot of uh, athletes and uh, uh, inter, uh, like wrestlers, entertainers, things like that. If you spend too much time in the airport, mm-hmm. you can kind of spot it. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna go with Ric Flair. Um, I think that one, that one, that one's probably the one I'm most proud of. Nice. So if you had like all the money in the world, what would you do with it? Oh, uh, petty revenge. <laughs> I wish I would get back at everybody that wronged me all the way down to like, you know, kindergarten. Oh, wow. You, you might be already, you must probably have a list ready. I get to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, 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 Billy Madison. I've got the, the list that I'm crossing out. Uh, I make this joke, uh, because this guy's, he's like literally one of my, uh, uh best friends growing up. Uh, this guy, Garrett, uh, he would play Nintendo and tell me that the, the other controller didn't work so that I just had to watch him play because he didn't want me to slow him down. So he wouldn't let me play Nintendo with him. Uh, so I would buy his childhood home and have a live feed of me playing his Nintendo alone in his childhood home, in his room, just uh, just to annoy him. I would, I would do things like that. Uh, I would probably start a foundation uh, to do some good, but that good would probably be Petty Revenge too. It'd be a foundation for Petty Revenge. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> Uh, so the next question you threw me off here with that answer. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, just, I couldn't that's, help it. That's actually yeah. it's a bit, so I got to use it. <laughs> um, the next question I have for you is: um, so if you had the time capsule to go back in time and to any era, which era would you pick? Go back in time. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I genuinely think I would have gone back to uh, now. Can I, I'd love some context. Am I going back as an adult, or am I go, or am I just like zipping back to? Because because I would pick I would pick the nineties. Okay. Because the nineties were when I was growing up as a young kid, and I think that I had an idea of like what that was like uh around me and i i know that 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 probably wasn't an accurate perspective because of uh my youth because i was I was a child growing up in that uh so i would go back just that far just to the 90s so that i could see the difference between what my perspective is now and what what things were like back then and how that probably uh, had an influence on on me or people. So if that helps me understand, I think that would help me understand how people change over time in modern time uh, more than, you know, if I could go 
annoy uh uh i don't know let's say founding fathers at cocktail parties you know i i think i would get more out of uh going back uh, to the 90s <laughs> plus i would know what to wear so <laughs> interesting perspective and uh, what is the most favorite issue you worked on policy or issue you know it was kind of accidental um working on uh, affordable housing and uh, uh homelessness uh, uh advocacy policy those were things that were pretty much put on my plate when I started working for the Realtors Association uh, that I I had no real expertise up until that point on. Uh, it wasn't really, it just wasn't really on my radar. And uh, I learned so much about how policy uh, programs and things can drastically change outcomes in people and lives uh, and how you can actually watch it in real time with a municipality or something it's very tangible so and i think that that one really broke my brain to find out things like there's no way for somebody to get healthy without the stability of a bed in place every night you can you can't get on medication you can't see doctors you can't have uh clothes for work you can't there's no there's all these all these dominoes uh of of getting people in a better place that just start with a roof and so uh i i i guess i i had a very passive understanding of that before and it it, it really changed the way i look at uh people in public policy after uh after working on that one hmm. and do you get to like meet people like like you know actual people to discuss what their issues are before you go and present it to the legislators who have uh, these yes problems? okay yes but i i will say and this is a good clarification for your your podcast but me as a guest technically i am not a uh lobbyist i am not uh, uh i am a, a local uh public policy advocate uh and that's uh, that has to do with South Carolina law with uh, you don't have to register as a lobbyist if you're doing local uh, public policy work. Uh, you do if you are uh, uh, being paid to advocate at the state legislative level uh, and uh, for uh, which it differs from some of our neighboring states. Uh, with my career, I've been working with trade associations such as uh, the realtors and home builders who we have our local organization that is in charge of our territory doing this kind of advocacy. And then we have our partners at the state association that we work with, but it's more like uh, we're, we pass the baton for them to, and they're, they're lobbyist for uh, the state to bring it to them. And so my job is to work with these committees, these task force, these, uh, these commissions, uh, any of these things where I get to uh, meet these people at the ground level in the community, get that input and bring it to uh, lobbyists. And a lot of times those lobbyists are with me uh, in order for state legislation. Now for local legislation, I mean, I'm, I'm big on having first person accounts, stories and things I can bring to people like uh, we were working on short term rental uh, regulations when they were uh, first popping up uh, in, in Charleston's market. And it was hard for people to wrap their heads around like, why, why, why should we allow this, this, uh, this industry uh, to, to grow? And the best case that I could find was being able to to meet uh, somebody, Rajanda, who explained to me like this is her way of keeping her family's home that's been in the family for generations is by having some supplemental income that could do this, and uh, without ha my argument really falls flat if it's not genuine and it doesn't come with a genuine interaction uh, with the people that th that this kind of legislation and. Uh, and legislation effects.
Mm. And is um is housing the primary um you know policy which you currently are passionate about? What is your passion in terms of the legislation? Yeah, uh, because of the uh, my work with those uh, two trade associations, uh, I became uh, um, I hit my uh, ten thousand hours in uh, housing uh, uh, public policy, and so um, I'm running with it. I like it. it. It's it's been it's it's kind of serendipitous that I did. You know, I was I was building houses. I got an engineering degree, and then I did campaigns for almost ten years. And then when I switched over to doing trade association work, uh, that it happened to be in housing. So okay. uh, yeah. it, it, it was kind of awkward when uh, when working for the home builders, uh, folks who talk to me about, or especially the, the builders and, and, and members like that, uh, about building a house as if I really remembered it or was doing it for a long time. So it was a lot of, yeah, yeah, that's... That's why we use those two by fours, you know, and I'm just sitting here thinking about the the two years that I was building houses and like, I don't remember a lot of that, but I do know a lot about uh, uh, regulations of uh, zoning and uh, uh, codes and, and and things that that can that can, that can really help or hurt an organ uh, uh, an industry. Mm. I know like we've gone like back and forth uh, in terms of your past and, you know, your existing career. Um, is there any other advice you would like to share? Any types of wisdom you'd like to share from the experiences you've had? Um, yeah, I, I, I would say get past, get past your imposter syndrome. Um, uh, and that will, that will be advice that is good for you when you're young and it'll probably be good advice for you when you're older. Very few people, uh, actually get past the idea that, uh, everybody's pretending to know more than they do. Everybody looks like they have it more together than they do. Uh, it's, it's okay. Uh, you, you just gotta, you gotta jump in you 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 gotta be willing and eager to learn uh and don't buy into the idea that you know uh everybody's everybody's smarter than you everybody's uh ahead of you in your career and they're gonna find out that you're a fraud or you know that you were actually a c student and not an a student like the rest of them uh they're all c students too or they're c students in life uh, there's, there's, there's so much, uh, wasted energy in that anxiety and that hang up that can be focused on, you know, learning, uh, being a, a good, decent human being to work with, because I mean, that is half of being successful in politics is being a, a competent, uh, enjoyable, reasonable person uh, day in, day out, not being so caught up in your head and 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 worrying about these things. Uh, you know, the if you lose a battle, if you lose a fight, if uh, legislation goes down, that that's okay. Uh, real real lobbyists and public policy experts know that there's going to be another project after that, and one after that. Uh, the people that you're quote your enemies. Uh, they're probably going to be your friends that you have coffee or drink with to over time. And don't, don't, don't play into this zero sum game and, and, and that you're a fraud. That's, that's silly. We have too much work to do. With that note, thanks so much, Patrick, um, especially for you being so authentic. And thanks for shedding a fresh perspective on lobbying. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the kind words. And at some point, I'll probably come and watch your show as well. I'll, I'd love to have you there. I might <laughs> drag you on stage and interview you. <laughs> oh, please don't do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick. Anytime.